John chapter 17 is one of the most remarkable prayers in the entire Bible. Uh, John chapter 17 contains the longest continuous prayer we have from the lips of Jesus. We know, especially from the Gospel of Luke, that Jesus was a man of great prayer. He prayed often, he prayed deeply, he prayed intensely. But we don't have much of the extended prayers of Jesus except in John chapter 17. So what we're gonna do as we take a look at this is we're gonna learn some principles of prayer from John chapter 17, recognizing that this is a prayer that in a sense only Jesus could pray, yet he could give us a pattern of prayer in the midst of it. Notice how it begins here, John chapter 17, verse one. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, now please notice, as Jesus begins this prayer, we will get a unique insight into his own heart and character as we examine it. I don't know if you've ever had the privilege of praying with a great man or woman of God, someone who really knows how to pray. Now, if you've never had that experience, listen to me, please. Seek out someone who knows how to pray and just pray with them. You will learn just from listening and being in the presence of their prayer. There is something genuinely revelatory about our own heart and mind as we come before God in prayer. When you truly pray and commune with God, you reveal something about yourself. And Jesus is gonna reveal himself in this particular prayer. Notice, too, in this first part of verse one, it says that he lifted up his eyes to heaven. That was the physical posture of Jesus as he prayed. It does not say that his hands were raised out, but they likely were because the common posture of prayer among the Jews at that time was to pray something like this, with hands out raised and with the head up. Now, the Bible doesn't command us to pray in that posture. It's more of a cultural thing. Our cultural custom of prayer is a little bit different, isn't it? What's kind of our cultural custom of prayer? Hands folded, eyes closed, head reverently bowed. You know, that, that's kind of the, the posture of prayer that we have. Now listen, there's nothing wrong with that posture of prayer either. It communicates something, doesn't it? M matter of fact, I kind of like the idea of folding of the hands because it means you have that doggone smartphone out of your hands for five seconds as you fold your hands in prayer. Just get it out of your hands, just grip them tight so you don't have to grab your phone. But listen, there's something beautiful about this posture of prayer, isn't it? One thing that it communicates is expectancy. Father, I expect you to come and meet with me. One of the greatest things we can have in our prayer life is a sense of expectation that God will meet us in prayer. And if you don't have it, then just say, God, I'm gonna have it in your name. I need to have a sense of expectancy. Sometimes our great fault is that we expect very little from God and then he gives to us as we expect. But Jesus lifted up his eyes and he prayed and he looked up towards heaven. See, heavens, this was a, a, a prayer of hope, a prayer of expectancy, a prayer of confidence in God. And I'll tell you one other thing about this prayer. It was an organized prayer. This is a prayer with a beginning, a middle, and an end. It's not just kind of casting out random thoughts towards heaven. This is a prayer that was thought about. And even though it maybe wasn't written down or notes given, th th there was an orderliness to the thought. In the beginning of this prayer, verses one through five, Jesus prays for himself. Then in verses six through 19, he prays concerning the disciples. Then in verses 20 through 26, he prays concerning all believers. Th there's an order, there's an organization to it. Sometimes our prayers are just much too haphazard. We don't give any thought. We, we don't think, hey, I'm gonna come into the presence of a great king. Why don't I think a little bit about what I'm gonna say before I get there? Now, look, you and I know that that can be abused. And we can look at prayer as a performance. Oh, Lord Godest, who livest in heavenest, you know, and uh, that kind of affectation and thing, and act like we're Shakespeare praying or something like that. 
No, we're not talking about that, but we're talking about a sense that says, listen, I am gonna come before a great God. I, I wanna have something organized. And, and listen, it, it, it's not a bad way to organize it. First, Jesus prayed for himself, then he prayed for his disciples, then he prayed for those who would believe later. I, I mean, maybe for ourselves, we come before God, maybe first we pray for ourselves, then maybe we pray for the immediate people around us, and then we pray for a broader sphere. But, but I mean, there's some sense of organization to it as he prayed. Now notice what's next, the second part of verse one, this is the actual beginning of his prayer. Father, the hour has come, glorify your son that your son also may glorify you. It's a fascinating beginning to the prayer and you don't know what a struggle it was for me to prepare this message of how much I had to cut out that I would not say because I'm trying to give myself about 35 minutes to speak to you about the most applicable things that we can learn from this prayer, about our prayer life, but make no mistake about it, this prayer of Jesus is a theological and a devotional and a just biblical gold mine. We learn so much about God and his nature and his work through this particular prayer. Notice how he begins here, Father, the hour has come before Jesus' hour of glorification had not yet come. Many times throughout the Gospel of John, he says, my hour is not yet come. My hour is not yet come. My hour is not yet come. But now it has come. But notice this as well. Look at that second part there of verse one. Let me just emphasize these words as I read it. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son also may glorify you. You know what this is? This is a prayer deep and rich with relationship. You are the father. I am your son. We sang it today, didn't we? I am a child of God. Do you see how deep that awareness was in Jesus as he prayed this? It's a very personal prayer. It's not to some distant deity, not some God who, who, who lives off in outer space, out on Alpha Centauri or some distant thing. No, no, no. It's I'm your son and you are my father. It's very deep with relationship. But then notice what he prays, and it's a very bold prayer. Glorify your son. Now, I told you that I don't know if we can strictly take this prayer as our prayer. This is not the disciples' prayer. We're learning principles from this. I don't know if I ever would or if I ever could come before God rightly and say, Father, glorify me. That seems to be appropriate for the Son of God to pray right before he was about to go to the cross. But please understand this. Even Jesus' prayer, glorify me, was actually a prayer concerned for the glory of the Father. You see, he could only glorify the Father if the Father would first answer the prayer, glorify your Son. So please understand, Jesus' real passion was for the glory of God the Father, but he understood that his own glorification would be the instrument. Now there's a lot to talk about with that. What Jesus had in mind when he spoke about glorification, we'll get to that in a moment. But just understand this principle. Jesus says, glorify your son that your son also may glorify you. Now, Jesus in this prayer, in the verses that follow, is going to give several reasons for that. Please note this. Reasons for the prayer. What's the request? Glorify your son. That's the request. But then Jesus is gonna give reasons for it. And I'll just kind of click them off. Lord, glorify the son because the hour has come. Glorify the son because the father will be glorified if you glorify me. Glorify the son, this is in verse two, because authority has already been given to the son to grant eternal life. Number four, glorify the son because Jesus is the only way to life. That's in verse three. And then again in verse three, glorify the son because it will finish the work that the father gave the son to do. But this is what I want you to understand. There is a logic to the prayer of Jesus. Father, I make the request 
And now I will lay out before you reasons why that request should be answered. And ladies and gentlemen, I just want to employ you. Do you ever pray like that? Sometimes our prayer life basically amounts to casting wishes up to heaven. Giving God a to-do list. I want you to know there's a dimension of prayer that, that, that is out there. And maybe some of you are familiar with it. Maybe you have, some of you have never experienced it. Maybe some of you knew it before, but you haven't done it much lately. But ladies and gentlemen, there's an aspect of prayer where we come before God and we say, Lord, do this. And then we lay out before him reasons, grounds why he should do it. Can I just give an example? You could pray. Personally, I'd be delighted by this prayer. Lord, bless Pastor David Guzik. Bless him. <laughs> now, now, why? Why? What reason? What grounds? And you could think, Lord, bless Pastor David because he's got to preach and, and we want to be fed the word of God. Use him to feed your sheep. Lord, bless Pastor David because um, he has a leadership role in this congregation and he needs your wisdom, he needs your grace. Lord, bless Pastor David because there's probably some places where he faces some spiritual attack. Would you strengthen him in the midst of it? Lord, bless Pastor David. And you, you lay out reasons before God. Lord, bless Pastor David because you said in your word that you would give pastors and teachers for the edification of the church, so fulfill that in him. Do you see what I'm talking about? Jesus didn't just cast up thoughts towards heaven when he prayed. He made a request and then he gave reasons or grounds why God should fulfill it. And that should inform our own prayer life. Now, don't miss what he says at the end of that verse though. That your son also may glorify you. Now, when Jesus said glorify your son, do you know what he was actually asking for? Lord, see me through the cross. For us, glory and the cross seem to be opposites. For Jesus, glory and the cross were the same. Now do you see that his prayer, glorify the son, was not a selfish prayer. It was a prayer that he would truly have the glory of God in and through him as he did this work of utter sacrifice. Now let's just read through the rest of this part where Jesus prays for himself. Uh, verse two, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as have given him, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Again, He's giving reasons for that basic request. And then here, the request in verses four and five is gonna be stated again, full of faith. He says, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Again, full of faith, full of confidence. The Son prays before the Father, laying out reasons for this great request. Now, before I go into the second aspect of the prayer, let me just remind you of this. That Jesus' passion in prayer was for the glory of God the Father. We should not look at prayer as a way to get our will done. We should look at prayer as our cooperating with God to accomplish his will. Now, please, don't think that your will and God's will are always in contradiction. This is a mistake many kind of spiritually, all right, I was going to say spiritually weird, but maybe that's not the best way to put it. Um, it, it's a strange form of spirituality that thinks, if I want it, it can't be God's will. But there's some people who think like that. But there's another way of thinking, isn't there? That whatever I want must be God's will. The, the truth is that sometimes it's one and sometimes the other, isn't it? 
Put that aside. But just understand this. Our passion in prayer should be for the accomplishment of God's work, God's kingdom. And this is why we need to have a heart that says, Father, glorify yourself. That's what we want to see happen through prayer. Now, let's take a look at the second part of the prayer, starting at verse 6, where Jesus is going to pray concerning the disciples. First, he's going to talk about his mission among the disciples. Verse 6, I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they've kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given them the words which you have given me, and they have received them, and you have surely known that I came forth from you, and that you have believed, they have believed that you sent me. Now in verses 6 through 8, let me ask you a question. Those verses I just read, where is the request in those verses? And the answer, as far as I can read it is, there is none. This was Jesus pouring out his heart in conversation with God. Friends, this is an important part of prayer, often neglected. Again, so much of prayer is a matter of balance in the Christian life. And so here's another area of balance in prayer that we need to remember. Prayer is not all about asking God to do things, but neither is prayer never about asking God to do things. This prayer of Jesus in John 17 is a good mixture of both. There are places where he asks God to do things very clearly. Very, he makes requests unto God, but there are also other times where he is just communing with God, speaking with him as a man would speak to his friend. Do you ever do that? I fear that I don't do it enough. I fear that I don't just chat with God enough. Now, I don't want to make it sound like what Jesus is talking about here is light or frivolous, but notice in verses 6, 7, and 8, he's not asking for anything. And you would have reason to turn your eyes upon those verses, verses 6, 7, and 8, and say, Jesus, doesn't God the Father already know all that stuff? Yes, he does, but he's communing with his God and Father and doing it in words. Okay, now on to verse nine. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours and yours are mine and I am glorified in them. Still no request in verses nine and 10, but now starting at verse 11, we get a request regarding the disciples. Ready? Here's the request. What was the request regarding himself? Father, glorify me, that I may glorify you, but glorify me. The request regarding his disciples, here's the first request, starting at verse 11. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you, Holy Father, Keep through your name those whom you have given me that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept and none of them is lost except the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. Do do you see what he's asking for in those verses? He's simply asking, Father, keep them. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a wonderful request because the disciples needed to be kept. They needed to be kept because their three years of discipleship school with Jesus were about to be over. They they, they needed to be kept because they were about to undergo the most intense crisis of their life. They, They needed to be kept because Jesus was no longer going to be with them. And so he says, Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me. Ladies and gentlemen, They needed to be kept, and if I could just say an aside, do not we need to be kept. We need to be kept from division. Father, keep us one. That was Jesus' prayer for his disciples. We need to be kept from error. Oh, there's a lot of error out there, isn't there, folks? Isn't there a lot of goofiness, a lot of weirdness out there? We need to be kept from error. We need to be kept from sin. Don't we live in a world that has landmines of temptation and difficulty all around us? We need to be kept from sin. And then finally, we need to be kept from hypocrisy. 
because hypocrisy is always at the door. Now, Jesus is going to elaborate on that first request right here in verse 13. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world just as I am not of the world. Now, starting at verse 17, Jesus is going to get into his second request for his disciples. Notice what his second request is. Verse 17, he talks about sanctifying them. He says, Father, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by the truth. What does he say? First, keep them. Secondly, sanctify them. What does it mean to be sanctified? The way some people think of sanctified, they think it means to be unpleasantly spiritual. That's what it means to be sanctified. That's not the definition of sanctified. Sanctified simply means to be set apart. Lord, keep them. Now, keep them apart from the world. It would do no good for the disciples to be kept, but to be kept just part of the world. They need to be kept, but they need to be kept as sanctified believers set apart from the world. Notice what he says in verse 18, and I gotta caution myself not to spend time on this. He says, as you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. You see, Jesus says, keep them, sanctify them, but send them, send them into the world. We are sent into the world. By the way, this is where we get our whole concept of the missionary. The Latin verb, and if you know Latin, just gently correct me afterwards because I'll probably get this wrong. The Latin verb to send is missio. We get our word missionary from it. It just means someone who sent. And you know what this means? It means all believers are sent. This is it. We're all sent ones. So, one request for himself. Father, glorify me. Two requests for his disciples. Keep them and sanctify them. With the implication that they would be sent as well. Now, Jesus is going to pray concerning all believers, starting at verse 20. This is so wonderful. He says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Now let me just say, this is delightful faith. Delightful faith. Number one, that Jesus would pray for you and I. Do you believe that it's possible for God to listen to five prayers at once? I do. do. Do you think it's possible for God to listen to 500 prayers at once? Five million prayers at once? There are capacities in deity that are completely beyond us. We can't do it. Sometimes we have trouble listening to one person, you know, much, much less two at a time. The, the wives just looked at their husbands when I said that. <laughs> All right, now... In his infinite capacity as God. Don't you think it's possible that when Jesus said, Father, I don't pray for these alone, but for those who will believe in his name, that maybe in a moment, the face of every believer flashed before the mind of Jesus? Is it possible that your face flashed before his mind? my face now it's impossible we think well if, if God can listen to five million prayers at once maybe he can do that as well but what I find so amazing about this and so relevant to us as we talk about praying in faith it's simply this please understand how amazing it is that he would pray believing that those disciples would preach a word that others would believe at that moment, 
when you knew that Peter was going to deny you, that all the disciples were going to run, that they're all going to cower in fear before the Romans, would you put your money on any one of them being a preacher that would persuade anybody? But Jesus, full of faith, he goes, no, Lord, I know this will happen. I know this is your word. I know this is your promise. He can talk about those who will believe me through their word. And then verse 21, this is what he prayed for us. This is his request for us. That they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they also may be one in us. That the world may believe that you sent me. The first request Jesus makes regarding us, those who would believe after that present generation of disciples, is that they'd be one. The second thing he prays for, look at verse 22. He says, and the glory which you gave me, I have given them that they may be one just as we are one. As the Father shared his glory with the Son, so Jesus wants to give his glory to his people. And ladies and gentlemen, this is a prayer we can pray as well. Sometimes I fear that there's not enough mark of the glory of God in our midst. And I'm not talking about a show. I'm not talking about entertainment. I'm talking about just something marked by the presence and the glory of God. Jesus prayed that it would be among his people. And then he prays for this unity founded in love. Verse 23, I in them and you in me that they may be made perfect in love And that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them and as you have loved me. And then notice this beautiful tender prayer that Jesus prays with verse 24. He says, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am and that they may behold my glory which you have given me for you loved me before the foundation of the world. Do you understand what Jesus prayed that night before he was crucified? He prayed for you and for I that we would make it to heaven with him. Possibly your face and my face flashed before his mind. He said, I want them to make it there to heaven. I want to be there with them. I want them to share in my glory. Now, let me conclude the prayer with these last two verses, and then I'll make some final remarks. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me, and I have declared to them your name and will declare it, that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. He ends the prayer all about relationship, and all about love. Now again, this is a prayer that begins in relationship and ends in relationship. It's a prayer from a father to a son, and you as a son or a daughter of God have a right to come before God, to come into his presence, and to pray boldly, to pray a thinking prayer that has some logic to it, It doesn't have to be haphazard to pray, and please take this. I would say, if there's any one point that I want you to take away from this, it's the idea to pray with reasons. Why? What? Let it flash in your mind. I'd like it if this one flashed in your mind. God, bless Pastor David. Why? But but that principle applies to whatever it is you would pray for. But then thirdly, understand that prayer is more than just giving God requests, although please understand, there is nothing wrong with giving God requests. He told us to ask for our daily bread. He told us, be anxious for nothing, but in everything with prayer and supplication. Make your requests be known to God. He wants us to bring our requests, but there should be times of just communion with God. With you, and for some of you this is tough, I don't know, maybe the smarter ones among us, it's tough for, because you got to get around a little leap in logic here. You just to tell things that you know God already knows. Don't you think Jesus knew that God already knew these things? Yet, he wanted to commune, and to commune not just over feelings, but over words. Uh, There's a lot for us to learn about prayer 
from this beautiful prayer of Jesus himself. Now, as I have felt uh, on these Wednesday nights, what a waste it would be if we spent our whole series of prayer talking about prayer, but not praying ever. And so what I want us to do is just like for the next 10 minutes, I know that's not long, this is just the appetizer for your own time of prayer that'll be much better. This is just that little bit of, you know, shrimp on the plate that makes you hungrier for the main meal. I want us to just take 10 minutes to pray. And look, I know some of you, it may feel a little bit awkward. Maybe you're new here, you don't know. You you don't have to pray with anybody. If you just want to stay in your seat and have come on with you and the Lord directly, that's fine. If not, turn to a couple people around you. But let's just pray for the next 10 minutes and then we'll conclude together with a song. Let's come before the Lord's presence and pray for something. And if you make a request... Give a couple reasons before God for it. He wants to hear your reasons, and the more biblically rooted your reasons can be, the better. So let's do that for the next 10 minutes. Let's spend some time in prayer together. Uh, Not not big groups, groups of only two or three or four at the most, uh, because again, we're only giving ourselves 10 minutes for this.
Okay, everybody, we want to finish with a final song. Um, but before we do that, I, I want to lead us in prayer um, for something that might be a little selfish, uh, or at least it's personal. But, you know, I'm the one who taught the Bible study tonight, and I have the microphone, so I'm going to take advantage of it. Uh, I, wa I want us to pray for my wife, Ingalil. She's on this dental mission trip to Trinidad and Tobago, and uh, she's been texting me. She said today she had the most exhausting day that she's ever had. She had the toughest day of extractions that she's ever had. Uh, it's been super blessed, but I can tell, man, she's given it her all. So I'm sure it would really strengthen her to know that uh, all these people just prayed for her tonight. So I'll pray. Please agree with me in prayer as we pray for God's blessing on that. Father, we pray for Ingalil as she's in uh, Trinidad and Tobago doing that great work, Lord, touching many lives, relieving pain and bringing the love of Jesus and setting the atmosphere for people to receive your gospel, Lord, doing it all in Jesus' name. Father, we pray that you'd bless her, that you'd bless the team. Uh, Lord, they are there doing your work. They're there to be your representatives, uh, but they need your strength in their body, in their soul, and in their spirit to do it. Father, do it just because you love the people of Trinidad and Tobago. You want to have mercy upon their needs. And you have sent Ingalil and that team there to be messengers of your love, of your mercy, and of your care. Pour out your grace upon our Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Pray. Amen.